Richard Bellotto. I teach in the English department, creative writing here at the University of Memphis. And it's really been my privilege this year to be the director of the River City Writers Series, who now welcomes its second guest of the year, Dr. Derek Caron. Um, let me tell you a little something about Derek. <laughs> Um, I'll give you the stock, the stock footage first. But, uh, Derek was born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but currently resides with his wife and son in Oxford, Mississippi, where he teaches in English and African American Studies programs at the University of Mississippi. His poems, his beautiful poems, widely published. Uh, his first collection of poems, Cotton, um, traces his familial southern roots, and his most recent collection of ropes, uh, which won the uh, 2014 Mississippi Institute of Arts and Letters Poetry Book Award, uh, is really steeped in a historical conversation between heralded African-American prize fighters like Jack Johnson, Joe Lewis, Joe Frazier, Mike Tyson, and his forthcoming collection, which I just can't wait to get, Stripper in Wonderland. Yeah. It will be published by LSU, uh, spring of 2017. In the introduction to Allen Ginsberg's collection of poems, Howl, William Carlos Williams writes, All poets are damned, but they are not blind. They see you with the eyes of angels. In Derek's visceral and evocative lyricism, he intertwines subjects of family, terror, loss, race, masculinity, femininity, athleticism, and love with the acuteness of one who is aware of such damnations. Yet, Derek's voice carries us to a much more complex realm where we can see in a poem from Ropes, Ali's empty cell calls him out, muscular language that calls upon us to see and hear the transformative image of what's at stake when one chooses to change his name. Quote, Cassius Clay can't keep from shaking at his own shadow. So scared, he changing inside and out. Don changed his name, he's so scared. Derek's poems seem to take me where I need to go, places expected, unexpected, take me to history's past and present, take me to that sweet science where we all do in battle, damned, but with the eyes of angels, speaking truth to power. So with great pleasure, I welcome my brother, my family, Derek Burrell. How are we doing? Mississippi, uh, I haven't spent as much time in, in Memphis as I would have liked to, to be spending. And um, when, when Richard extended the invitation, I was more than excited to, to be here. And the warmth and the love and the southern hospitality that I've felt since being here has just been completely, completely wonderful. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read primarily from the book that's back there, Ropes, which is a, a book that's inspired by African-American pugilist heavyweight boxers, um, their persona poems, and the voices of these boxers. And I'll just tell you, this would be redundant for some of you that were present earlier today. 
how this idea started for me was watching a documentary and seeing someone, just a sort of no-name boxer, uh, standing at Jack Johnson's gravestone in Chicago and thanking Jack for all that he'd done for boxing and for the heavyweight division fraternity. And uh, I started thinking, what if Jack could talk back? You know, yeah, right? <laughs> that would be dope, right? What, what, would he, what would he say to this young man? And what would those conversations sound like? So removing that young man and replacing him with some of the most celebrated African-American heavyweight prize fighters is, is, is what I did and how I started to research for this project. So you'll hear poems and various voices. Um, I kind of want to ask this question. It might be a stupid question. There are no classes up here, right? Because I can be a little loud and I don't want to disrupt. It's other events. Oh, tell me. Like I don't want anyone to feel like they shouldn't come in if people are coming in, so maybe not. But thank you for asking. Um, you want to serve anyone. I'm going to try my hardest, too. <laughs> Start with Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson is fatherless had a very complicated upbringing. And Mike Tyson was discovered at a group home uh, in which a, one of the security guards also worked as a, as a boxing trainer. And uh, he worked with Cus Diamato, uh, who was a famous trainer who trained Floyd Patterson. He said, look, Cus, you know, I got this, this kid who was 14 at the time, 15. I'd like for you to see. Uh, we think he's pretty talented. And so Cus saw him and immediately said, uh, he's going to be the next heavyweight champion of the world. And in fact, he's going to be the youngest heavyweight champion of the world. So the book opens up with this poem that's in the voice of Cus Amato, Cus Amato on fear. And it starts with an actual, actual epigraph uh, that Cus has stated in many interviews that says, I feed the fire and it becomes a roaring blaze. Cus Amato, Catskill, New York. 1980. Cuss the amount of fear. He tells me he's afraid. I tell him of the hero and coward. How both feel the same. How fear is a fire and friend. When the deer crossing an open field spots the speeding blazer intent on blazing it to oblivion, nature begins the survival process, causing the heart to beat faster, the deer to get out of range. But Mike is no deer, and these bums, no Chevy. When they find themselves deep down dark alleyways and the reaper just a dance floor away, they find themselves a wick lit on each end, chained to the beat of a roaring blaze. Letters to Joe Frazier, they're writing the, the sort of framework of the text is epistolary, so these men are writing letters back and forth across these historical time periods. This is letters to Joe Frazier from Mike Tyson, Brooklyn, New York, 1970. Joe, I returned from the hospital and sat front row as daddy spun mama about the house till she became a broken ballerina in a blood-smeared tutu. If my fists were bigger than golf balls, I would have driven them through his head with an assassin's intent, believing one bullet could change the world. If you know anything about Mike's biography, he has this fascination with pigeons, and that started when he was a kid. He was a lonely kid um, who existed in much solitude. He found 
uh, companionship amongst these birds, right? And what's ironic is pigeons are like the pigs or the catfish of the birds, right? We're not supposed to love pigeons. And uh, Mike uh, took a liking and a loving to these birds. Um, Mike says that he was a scary kid growing up, and he didn't think he could fight, right? But he collected these pigeons, he would feed them, right? Housed them. Uh, one day, one of the guys from the neighborhood said, hey man, why are you always like, messing with those nasty birds, man? Mike says, well, I like these birds. Uh, the guy grabs one of the pigeons and breaks the snack. Yeah, right. And um, Mike knocked him out <laughs> out of anger. And he said, that's when I knew I could fight. And I did that to the neighborhood bully. You'll hear that reference. Brownsville, New York, 1977. Joe, I'm the Pigeon King, a wizard with no wands, a boy afraid of his own footsteps. The air in the projects is poisonous. There are monsters who find what you love, break it slowly like the neck of my favorite bird. This day I learned that fear and fire are lovers intertwined so closely they become one figure. Cat School, New York, 1980. Joe, I've met God. He's old and weak, white and bald. We call him cuss, but I'm sure only God could make blood sport poetry. We watch black and white reels of great fighters till I'm dizzy, till I'm vomiting the speed of Lewis, the anticipation of Marciano. Boxing is a symphony of wills, an orchestra of skills. I've studied your left hook under careful eye, played pick a boo with the night, buried my chin into my sternum, shot son of a bitch from these thighs. Um, this morning I was asked about a list of maybe you asked me that question, what was one of the most bizarre things that I experienced through my research of these men. And I mentioned learning that I thought I was a boxing aficionado before I started my research, and there was so much to learn. I had already decided that I was going to work with Mike Tyson and Joe Frazier, but I never knew that Mike Tyson fought Joe Frazier's kid, Marvis Frazier. What a name, right? Marvis Frazier. Um, <laughs> and so I, I went back and I watched that fight, and Mike knocked him out in a minute and a half, a minute and 45 seconds. And as I'm watching this slaughter of Marvis Frazier occur, I'm thinking of the sort of emotional turmoil that Mike had to be experiencing when you have to punish your idol's kid this way, right? So after the fight, they were interviewing Mike Tyson, and to my surprise, he was the same Mike Tyson. He was unapologetic. Very forthcoming and says, Hey, you know, I don't care who kid this is, he can get it too. Right? And so, this is me imagining the night before the fight in the voice of Mike Tyson. It's called Not Joe Frazier, Tyson Wright's Apology Letter, July 25th, 1986. Joe, tomorrow I'll beat your boy like he stole my favorite bird, like he robbed cuss of air, like his last name, not Frazier. I respectfully intend to crush his ribs and will in one blow, smack that kid round the ring, remind him his name, not Joe. You do the same. So cast no voodoo once this is done. And although I've hung your posters along the hallways of my ambition, don't find yourself vengeful. Or you too can feel the supernova. 
what I'm told is a carnival in the head. Dancing elephants, singing monkeys, floating beds. A boogeyman's bad hands. A sinner's lullaby lyrics. The junkie's vision when angels come to visit. So, one of the reasons I was interested in pursuing Mike Tyson's voice is not just because he was my favorite boxer growing up, but it was also because after years and years of listening to him talk before fights and post fight and in interviews, I really started to um, take an awareness to his own poetry and his bravery in some of the things that he would say. I felt like he would say a lot of things that we all would think but wouldn't say. And he was very much aware of himself of being the big black villain. And a lot of what he did was to play that up. Um, so if you can get past the list and the intimidation of the big muscles, right? Seeing him knock people out and really listen to some of the things that he says. It's extremely interesting. I was interested in investigating these men as not only boxers, but as fathers, as sons, as husbands. And so I felt like I couldn't talk about these men without talking about these men without talking about the women in their lives. So this is uh, Letters on Love, Mike Tyson writes Muhammad Ali. And it starts with something that Mike Tyson said in the documentary Tyson. And he was talking about romance. And he was talking about his um, deep, deep, deep infatuation with women. And it went off in this really bizarre direction, but at some point he said this, and it stood out to me. He said, I like to watch her like a tiger. What I want is the extreme. I want to ravish them. It's like, damn, Mike Tyson talking about ravishes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what he said. Um, one, Muhammad, if men are measured in earnings, then pharaohs must be measured in harems. I approach the ring of romance relentlessly. Shoot Eros esque uppercuts of desire at long legs and short lived repudiations. I own them. What's the worth of waste? Belts without women to decorate them. Mansions with no furniture. I'm not into flutes, Muhammad. I make love like I make sport, deliberate and devastating. A tornado moved on, leaving the ravage to revel in their ruins. Two. Has anybody seen the um, Barbara Walters, Robin Gibbons, Mike Tyson interview? Two people. Well, just a quick backstory. I can tend to talk too much, and I'm sorry about that. Y'all can check Facebook while I'm talking. Um, <laughs> um, but just some context. So Mike and uh, Robin had this tumultuous, Robin Gibbons had this tumultuous, tumultuous uh, marriage, but they kept it, you know, they kept the happy face on in public. So they did this live interview with Diane, um, Barbara Walters, and uh, Robin Gibbons revealed all of their sort of personal business during this interview. And Mike is just sitting there like a statue with like the Frankenstein look and he's not talking. And she's like, he abuses me, he has anger management issues, he's violent, he's out of control. And um, obviously the cameras didn't capture this, but after that, Mike went to the house and broke everything in the house and hopped in his car and drove off. And Either that night or a few nights later, I can't remember which night it was, but it was near that, that time he got in an accident speeding. Um, just really, really pissed off. He felt ambushed. Um, and also, the, the sort of 
narrative that was floating around the gossip world was that you know that was on purpose and Rodney Gibbons wanted to set him up right, to take all his money. You know how y'all do. No, I'm just kidding. Um, um, so this is just me trying to get into my psyche about that moment. Two, Muhammad. This chick has lost her mind. Pick the wrong place, wrong time to tell me she's unsatisfied, that I'm unruly, aggressive, unfaithful, manic, misogynistic, juvenile. Barbara Walters refereed that the ambush. Her little pointy nose, a sword in my back. <laughs> She never sent us to neutral corners, never gave a standing eight count or asked if I could continue. Robin stood taller than Mitch Blood Green, her hot barrage of heavy blows enough to melt iron. Three, this is referencing Mike Tyson's convergence to uh, Islam. Three, Muhammad, there is only one love in this life. Like Muhammad, you spread your gospel and rings worldwide, let verses on the foreheads of foes. Allah found me in a prison cell and wiped me clean. Now I know how it feels to willingly hit your knees, open your hands. Let something in. One of the best things that happened to me growing up, I grew up in the 90s for the most part. That was my adolescent years. And um, me and all of my homeboys were huge Tupac fans. And I mean, we like worshiped Tupac. That was the gospel. <coughs> we would do whatever Tupac said to do. Tupac could say, Everybody jump up out the window. He'd be like, all right. <laughs> jump out, like, we did it, y'all. Um, we did it, Pac. <laughs> now what do we do? Um, and so with Mike Tyson being my favorite boxer, what happened was they both went to prison on similar convictions, right? These were rape convictions. And uh, I always preface this poem by saying, I'm, I'm not interested because I don't know who's innocent or guilty. I know the courts said they both were guilty. That's how we're deciding on guilt when they were guilty. But they both, both proclaimed their innocence, right? And um, Mike Tyson was out of prison when Pac went in. Pac's in prison. I'm watching this interview with Tupac and he says, yeah, you know, one of the things that really helped me when I went into prison, because when I first went in, I was a young, angry black man. I hated society, I hated the establishment, I hated this country. I was just angry and full of rage. But one of the things that helped me was receiving a letter from Mike Tyson, who told me to get my life together. He said that's when I realized that I need to really turn things around. I'm watching the interview and I'm thinking, So you waited for Mike Tyson, who's pretty fucked up, <laughs> right, to tell you that you need to get your life together. That's like the pot calling the kettle black, right? Um, but that's how it went, you know. And um, <coughs> after Mike, uh, after Tupac got out of prison, they became really good friends. And for me, the guys I grew up with, that was like the best of both worlds. Our favorite athlete and our favorite entertainer were like hanging out. We're like, this is amazing. And, Tupac would record these songs for Mike Tyson as he entered the ring, and they were um, inaccessible songs, songs that we couldn't get, right? It was just for that one night, for that one fight, and this was back in the day of VHS, and so we would record all Mike Tyson's fights, and after the fight was over, we would listen to those songs, or the, the Mike Tyson, I'm sorry, the, the, the Tupac song, play it back, write down the lyrics, listen to it again, try to finish the lyrics, and then just rap the rap all week at school. So this is me imagining that letter, what that letter might have sound like when, when Tupac read that letter from Mike Tyson. Tupac Shakur reads letter from Mike Tyson, and it starts with an epigraph 
Tupac song, Letter to My Unborn Child. And at some point in the song, he says, ain't no way in hell that I could ever be a rapist. Clinton Correctional Facility, New York, 1995. Voice of Mike, Mike Tyson. Pac, I've been where you are. Rubbed palm against concrete walls, confusing the cold, rigid surface for a woman. No, a cadaver. I know what it is to be held accountable, to make love with the crown on your head, for jesters to juggle during the romantic hour. Prison is no place for gods. It'll yank stars out of you. And once they've taken your stars, they'll come for your moons. I wish I was warned of how roses can be keys to prison doors, how the word rapper can be mistaken for rapists, how sodomy and slavery sometimes look the same in dark. They'll try to make a dragon out of you, show your fire on the six o'clock news, try to make you forget your mother's songs. But when the cell block's silent, the rhythm will return. The 808's burning in your throat like Hennessy, your voice enough to make speakers free. Jump up out the window. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is in the voice of Mike Tyson's second wife, Monica Turner. They met while he was still in prison. So I'm going to read this in her voice. Um, just imagine that I have a really soft, poetic voice. <laughs> Like Corey. <laughs> um, this is called The Lion Whisperer, Monica Turner Believes. And it starts with the Mabel Stark quote, who was a famous lion tamer. Mabel Stark said, I love these big cats as a mother loves her children. They can be subdued but never conquered, except by love. In the voice of Monica Turner, The Lion Whisperer. Our courtship witnessed by cold. Metal bars took snapshots while mustache guards with guns provided the grimy backdrop. And soon my words were petting the untamed feline numb. Rule one, you must never show fear. I said I wanted to be his doctor. He wanted to be my donor. I whispered about the stethoscope, its ability to locate absent hearts, the scalpel beneath my tongue. I promised a revival, a baptizing of some sort, a surgery, a procedure to jumpstart the soul. I vowed to be more than a friend or mother. I was made to be his keeper, to do what Mabel Stark had once done. Lay a warm hand on a wild thing to each morning count both my blessings and fingers. I'm going to jump to the next section, which is uh, Joe Frazier. I read the Marcus Frazier poem earlier, right? When Mike Tyson beats down Marcus Frazier. That sounds like. This is um, when Marvis was a, a kid, he watched his dad fight George Foreman. And this was back in the day before George became like 
Here's my grill, everybody. <laughs> Let's grill some stuff. Um, he was kind of Tyson before Tyson. Very intimidating. Him and Liston, very intimidating. You know, we get people in and out the ring. And Marvis talked about never seeing his father lose that way. Um, even when Joe would lose to Muhammad Ali, you know, they'd go 15 rounds and they'd be sweating and it'd be a long fight. But um, this fight, George got him out, I think, in three or four rounds. And if you watch the fight, this, I probably shouldn't say this. It almost looked comical, though, because Joe is kind of jumping around as he's getting hit. It seems like he's faking, right? He's, he's taking his punishment. He's trying to run away, but as he's taking the punishment, he's kind of lunging in the opposite direction, like to run away. And Marvis talked about his perception of what he thought was happening there and this idea of the invincibility of our heroes, right? I don't believe our heroes are invincible. So this is in the voice of a young Marvis Frazier. Marvis Frazier bears, bear, bears witness, excuse me. Marvis Frazier said this in an interview. When my father failed the first time, I started laughing. Kingston, Jamaica, January 22nd, 1973. Daddy a man, daddy unstoppable, he not afraid of no George, not afraid of no fight. I never seen so many black, black people ever. This must be Africa's little brother. George come out dropping haymakers and daddy so funny how he toying, doing that dance that make people dizzy. If little Africa is black, how black is Big Africa? Probably black as daddy's fist when he pulls him out ice. I hope we get this over quickly and head back to Philly. But George keep on swinging. Like we wronged him. Like I took his son's lunch money. Like he don't know. Daddy don't lose. Ali versus Frazier, too. Ali's gloves delivers the punchline. Madison Square Garden, New York, January 28, 1974. Before the fight, Ali had been making jokes about Frazier. Right? And they, he called him a sellout, called him a monkey basically pit a large black constituency against Frazier. Up until the time that Joe Frazier passed away, he was still bitter about that. He talked about Ali's Parkinson's being a result of the evil that he had done to other people when he was younger. It's often said that Ali was just trying to sell fights. So I'm, I'm, this, this poem is imagining Ali's gloves doing some of the work that Ali did. Two boxers walk into a ring, but Joe forgot the one about the angry nigger with the flat nose, the one that takes 12 rounds and a lot of blood to hash out. Two boxers walk into a ring, one a dancing Adonis, the other an awkward Neanderthal, an appetizer of hate feeds the garden before the bell, foreshadows the pending tail whooping. Two boxers walk into a ring. Sportsmanship had been discarded several black eyes ago. Decency hid its head in a dark hole. Frazier had been tired of our shit and game plan a funeral for Ali's mouth. Two boxers walk into a ring, but Joe forgot about the one that talks about the angry nigger with the flat nose, the one that takes 12 rounds and a lot of blood to hash out. I'll read the poem that Richard referenced. None of these poems actually assumes Muhammad Ali's voice. 
Richard and I were at lunch today talking about it, and I admitted to him, I said, I was scared. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with that. Um, and so, this is me uh, being a scaredy cat, trying to get close to that. And this is Ali's empty cell when Ali decided to not attend the Vietnam War and was locked up. This is Ali's empty cell calling him out. It starts with the Muhammad Ali epigraph or quote. Muhammad Ali once said, I'm so fast that last night I turned off the light switch in my hotel room and was in bed before the room was dark. I tried it last night. It's impossible. <laughs> you got to do um, <laughs> Ali's empty cell. I'm sorry. Yeah, Alex and myself are waiting him. Clay can't keep from shaking at his shadow. So scared he changing inside out. Done changed his name, he's so scared. Sometimes, some things so pretty, they start to look ugly. Just real ugly. The problem with ugly folks is they don't know when they ugly. <laughs> Try and distract you by running their mouth. Clay real good at running. Somebody told him about my record. 15, 1, 87, serve death. Sentences to make a sage chain smoke. Stop running, Clay. Come get it over with. We can write poems if you'd like about butterflies and bees. Rhyming sonnets or haikus while I come fool you for a few. I wanted to do something else that I wanted to read from my new collection too, just a few. Y'all doing okay? Yeah, sure. <laughs> All right. So I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And um, previous to moving down here to Oxford four years ago, I had no experience, no intimate experience with the South. And when I got down here, it felt like another world. I felt like I should have a passport. <laughs> um, in very, very complicated ways, right? The, the sensibilities and the registers were just completely different. You know? Where I'm from, you don't look at people in the eye. You know? I lived in Chicago for a couple of years, too. So keep that head down and keep walking. Talk to you in the south. Like, you really want to talk to you? <laughs> you know, I didn't know that being asked in Walmart how I was doing would be like a 10 minute commitment. I <laughs> thought you'd just say good and keep it cool. That's not how it was. So, when we moved down here, um, a portion of the book chronicles that transition for my wife and I. When we moved down here, my wife was seven months pregnant. She was on bed rest. Um, we had to get clearance to, from the doctor for her to fly down here. And um, it was just her and I. We had no family. You know, I had this new job at Ole Miss. And it took a few weeks for our furniture to arrive. She's on bed rest. We're on a blow up mattress for a couple of days. And so, I'm just going to read a few poems that talks about that transition. Thank y'all for being so attentive. I really appreciate it. Y'all are the true gifts. I always say that y'all just allow me to do what I love to do, and that's just express myself. So thank you. It's called Astronauts in Mississippi. <laughs> and I'll say this. I know I talk a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> y'all probably got places to be. <laughs> but I'll say this. After being down here for three months and just trying to jump into the culture, right, you just sort of dive in because you feel like such a stranger. I went back home talking to my people back in Milwaukee and they're like, why are you talking like that? Like, like, like from the country or something. <laughs> Astronauts in Mississippi. Why don't we cop rehearse country accents? 
for a few weeks, snatch a sir or ma'am or y'all from the dregs of a past life. The dregs of a past life contaminate this ether surrounding us and me. Hell, I'm just captivated and captive to this red earth. All this scorched earth on this earth, constellations of cotton fields in its atmosphere. And I'm rolling, too green to shoot it whole, too black to be green. There's a Martian beside the road, rotating a hog ceremonially. Heat rises from red, and all I need is a place to land this damn spaceship and Martian money. Yes, Martian money. For a piece of what we've come in peace for, an anthropological undertaking, a hot plate with a cold narrative, a tasting zoo, a graveyard, and yard bird. Couple more. Y'all hang in there. Thank you. <laughs> After our furniture arrived, um, on Friday night, my wife's eight, eight months pregnant, the semester had just started, just went to work that week. It's Friday, finished my first week of work, we got our furniture, we're feeling good. It's September 15th, due date is October 15th, feeling really good finally. We go get um, great food, gyros. Take them back home, put a bunch of hot stuff on them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, feeling good. My wife says, um, you know they make this joke that if you eat hot stuff, what happened? Can't go in the labor. Can't go in the labor. I'm like, ah, they say a lot of things. <laughs> She went into labor that night. <laughs> Can't make this up a month early. Um, so there's this romantic idea that you have in your head about your first kid. This was our first child. That, you know, baby's born and, you know, dad cuts the end of the cord. He's sitting the baby on mom's chest. And it's just like, oh, everyone's crying. Like, this is great. Um, but that wasn't our experience. <laughs> I didn't know what to do because I'd never done it before. So, you know, I get to the hospital and I'm just waiting for people to start running out like I see on TV. And it's dead silent in the hospital. This is Baptist Memorial. And we walk in and no one's there. And it's just like, well, this is the country, huh? Right? And then uh, there's one guy at the desk and I'm like, hey, mom, my wife is late. I'm like, let's go. Call all your people. Like, everybody should be running down right now. And he's like, I need you to fill out these forms. And I'm like, no. And so it reminded me of that scene in. The Godfather, where they, um, the attempt on Vito's life was made in a hospital. I remember watching the movie saying, No hospitals are like that. Back in Milwaukee, every time I've ever been to the hospital, people are shot, they're stabbed, like there's stuff happening, there's a lot of babies being born, it's like chaotic. And there it was just, it was just quiet. It was just really quiet. And when he was born, he was four pounds, 14 ounces, and not breathing. And he stayed in the hospital for a week. And we stayed in the hospital. Baptist Memorial. Surely people die here, born here, bleed here. These floors surely catch desperate. Dear Father, Hail Mary, stay with me. Camera sniffs spirits, obliviously scouring each floor for familiar. Tones, earth tones familiar, automatic doors, the waiting room familiar, the forms, the wheelchairs. The last time I was here, two cousins laid stabbed. Wait, shot. No, one stabbed, one shot, all dead. What is it with the hospital, silent enough to record a hymn? Or her, eulogizing, she'd rather die than birth this baby. And quiet. Last one. The cowardly obstetrician delivers a body. It starts with a quote from the Wizard of Oz, What makes a king out of a slave? said the cowardly lion. Courage! The cowardly obstetrician 
delivers a body. And he's not breathing. Not breathing and blue. Not breathing blue baby of mine. No, ours. We made this. Abracadabra, blue, not breathing baby on a tequila sacked Saturday night. You calculated the math, studied that calendar. You said it was this day, that Saturday. That night you were on a tequila and rum witch hunt. A stripper and your swagger. You were a horny homecoming king and I was just there. You swear you were just there. Something for me to die in. But I, me, and my guide say it was Sunday. After brunch, after I came down from yesterday's yellow brick road. Remember I said, honey, fuck that yellow brick road. I want to travel a dirt one with you. Want to count flying things on the porch of a shotgun shack. Remember I said, let's watch our, let's wash our dirt down with champagne and begin baptize. We are promised like mid-morning prayer. Flooded lungs at an ocean's floor. <laughs>